Account Marketing is a podcast for business owners and leaders produced by my dad, Steve Davis, and his colleague at Talked About Marketing, David Olney, in which they explore marketing through the lens of their own four Ps, person, principles, problems, and perspicacity. Yes, you heard that correctly. Apart from their love of words, they really love helping people. So they hope this podcast will become a trusted companion on your journey in business. David, what is the first rule of the Talking About Marketing podcast? I don't know. I would say the most important thing is that we should probably turn up with a positive attitude and looking to solve problems. That's a good first rule. Well, I was going to say it was you do not talk about the Talking About Marketing podcast if I was going to plagiarise the Fight Club and make the whole enterprise pointless but fun. In that case, we can go silent right now and listeners enjoy the static. (laughs) Actually, looking at the Fight Club rules, number one, you don't talk about it. Number two, you don't talk about it. If someone says stop or goes limp, taps out, the fight is over. We don't have a safe word for that, do we, David? We all need it. Uh, I thought our safe word for everything was porridge. Okay. Uh, Only two guys to a fight. Well, that's what we've got here. One fight at a time. We record one episode at a time. No shirts, no shoes. Sorry, it's a cold day. I'm wearing socks. Okay. At least you're topless. That's At least you've got that. Halfway there. Yes. Uh, Fights go on as long as they have to, which is what we do for our podcast. And if this is your first night at Fight Club, you have to fight. So... Let's get ready. You've got to record, David. You've got to record. I'll do it. Ow! I didn't do it. Our four Ps. Number one, person. The aim of life is self-development. To realise one's nature perfectly. That is what each of us is here for. Oscar Wilde. Now, a few weeks ago... David, at the time of recording, I watched the Chris Rock comedy special Selective Outrage. It was the first time I'd really watched a Chris Rock comedy special. His style of comedy delivery isn't my cup of tea. He sort of bulldozes his points into the audience and people laugh out of shock. (laughs) And there are some that are classically hand-tooled jokes, but others thrust an idea on the table and go on, react. It's quite an interesting, interesting stuff. Have you, have you listened to much Chris Rock? Enough to stop listening. Okay, so not your cup of tea. No, like to me, he's trying to push hard enough to get an emotional response and to get the kind of thinking brain off the table. So the thinking brain's got nothing to put together and eventually the emotional brain just responds to the prod, whether it's discomfort or release of discomfort into a laugh. But yeah, it, it's not really my scene. I would much rather you know, go back to the classics of Lenny, Henry, or Billy Connolly. Mm. Well, it's interesting. I was watching it, and about halfway through, I think, well, sometime throughout, he suddenly veered into this little bit about Lululemon, which is a, what would you call them, a upscale retailer of sportswear and gym wear, et cetera. And, yeah, it's uh, a lifestyle brand for people into fitness and health. And I will put you know, my hand in the air and say my travel yoga mat is Lululemon because it's the best you know, travel mat. Oh, you're going to love this excerpt. Let's have a Probably listen. Probably not. <laughs> Let's have a listen. Lululemon, I walk by, and in the window of every Lululemon, there's a sign that says, we don't support racism, sexism, discrimination, or hate. And I'm like, who gives up? You're just selling yoga pants. I don't need your yoga pants politics. Tell me how you work on ball sweat. In Lululemon. They sell hundred dollar yoga pants. They hate somebody. They hate the poor. There we are. Lucky he didn't reference the yoga mats, David. Uh, Still wouldn't change my opinion of how good a travel mat it is. (laughs) Well, look, the thing that I think struck me is amid all his show, this had the sort of shtick that was more classically comedic with a strong social justice message. I mean, that the whole undercurrent of this show of selective outrage was poking at hypocrisy. And it just brought a couple of things together because... There's a difference between 
actually being against racism, sexism, discrimination and hate and just telling people that you're against it. And there's a middle ground there somewhere because I believe, we believe that the enterprises we're engaged in should be constructed to do some sort of positive good in the world. I, I wouldn't work with anyone who didn't subscribe to that, but that's different from going around saying it. And it was brought home to me. I had to go to the uh, netball on the weekend and I watched the Thunderbirds and the Fever, which was a great game, by the way. And there was a wonderful welcome to country, short, earnest, perfect, and poignant. And then I reflected on, because I'm a theatre reviewer, how there's a bit of a trend among some theatre groups of making their acknowledgement of country longer and longer and more contrived. And there's something in me, David, that doesn't sit with this. It seems like posturing, a bit like the greenwashing that we get when you know a major oil company says, hey, we're here and we love the environment and we think flowers are nice as they trample over them and poison the ground. So, so from a personal perspective, in our businesses, in our organisations, I just wanted to share these mishmash of thoughts so that we can take a little check. Are we walking the walk or are we just talking it? Your thoughts, David? I think I'll start with the Lululemon example because you know, there I use one of the products. I'm not really interested in all the, the lifestyle and afterwear clothing. I just wear cheap bamboo clothing to do my yoga practice. But I think what Lululemon do is interesting. They make their stand on issues very clear as you enter the store because they've wanted to make their stores a really safe place for people who agree with all of those statements to be themselves and feel comfortable. Yep. And I think at the heart of it, even if their message doesn't translate well to the people outside their community, like Chris Rock, who's looking for a way to build a gag, it's resonating very well with their community who overtly want to signal the things they believe in and are willing to spend $100 on a pair of yoga pants because they're made somewhere where the materials didn't waste too much water. Ideally, it's made of a material that's renewable. The people who made it are allowed to form a union. The dye that was used to colour it doesn't poison a river and kill everything. So in a sense, this kind of virtue signalling is now ubiquitous in the world and in a lot of cases is very uncomfortable if you aren't part of the community that shares the virtue signalling. And I think you know, your description of going to the netball and the welcome to country being a really good example of it, that's another thing where this is meant to be more than virtue signalling, but in a sense with the welcome to country, we're talking to every group who turns up and some groups are very much aware of Indigenous culture and what the welcome to country means. Other people just go, all right, I can sit quietly through this, I don't really understand it. And other people go, this is a waste of time. So virtue signalling to a specific group where you're a part of it can be very easy and successful and make sense to the group on the inside. But if you're trying to talk to people who aren't interested, virtue signalling falls flat. Yeah, I think there's plenty of nuance uh on the table here because mm. it was actually that reflection. There's a difference between the welcome to country when an actual elder is there, has been paid Precisely. to be there, yep. and an acknowledgement of country. And and yet, so I, 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 there is nuance because on one hand, you could write it off as mm. glib virtue signaling because, oh, yes, we'll just read badly this acknowledgement of country. And, and that's most on. of our experience of it is yes. not meeting someone from the culture for whom this is their lived experience. Mm. It's normally uh, and now it's time to go through this process, which should and could be very important. But do we understand it? Does the person delivering it understand it? Do we have a cohesive understanding? And, and again, we're straying into interesting ethical and philosophical territory here, and we're going to have to bring it back in a minute for – for people running small business. And I think the critical takeaway in that is, are you talking to the group who already know who you are and care, or are you talking in an inclusive way to let people know what they can expect interacting with you? And how do you balance those two things? I think that's the key, is 
how do you balance? Is actually going through the the motions authentically of actually thinking this through. Are we doing mm. anything for lip service because that's what you're meant to do? Or is it part of it? Because yet again, even the badly read acknowledgement of country or the the sign up the front that says, hey, we don't like racism, mm. even though it's susceptible to those things being written off as glib, maybe they still create play a function because at least mm. it's being mentioned and the absence is also saying something as well. And to, and to a proportion of the community who know what it means and know they're welcome and know they're safe, having it said just straight up at the beginning, bluntly, actually gives them a sense of feeling like this place is okay and I'm going to be okay. And in a world where people feel less and less safe, anything we can do in our businesses to say to people, even if we don't entirely understand you, and you don't entirely understand us. We're trying to signal that this is a safe and inclusive place where you'll be treated with respect. And also hinting that that's how we expect you to behave when you interact with us. Mm. So I think this is fertile ground to reflect on. Yes, it's ethical and philosophical, but it is it brings everything together. Well, the whole reason we reflect on who our customer personas are, who it is we feel we're best placed to serve, is a lens through which you can look at this. Now, if your group of people hate anything at the virtue end of the spectrum, then you've opted to serve these people and that's the bed you've made. Or is there a small role you can play if you think it's important to bring them along on a journey but then how far removed is that from your core business? And then how do you separate your core business from your whole of life as a human being engaged in work every day? This is not a black and white answer. Maybe a final thought from me on this is, I think one of the things we're having to deal with in the world at the moment is clearly we're in relatively stressful economic times for a lot of people. There is more and more pressure, um, how much money people have and what they can spend it on and how little it buys. And I think one of the flow on effects of this is that once people get through the necessities, the majority of people have less money to spend and therefore are spending more time thinking about how they're going to spend it. And if people are feeling stressed about what's going on economically, they want to feel good about the things they do that are meant to be fun or enjoyable or rewarding or give them a sense of gratification or satisfaction. So if you can think about the fact that your customers are thinking more about, I've got a little bit of money to spend, how do the ways I spend money impact the world? How do they impact me? Then you can probably do a better job of connecting with people who are thinking longer and harder before they spend money on your product or service. Our four Ps. Number two, principles. You can never be overdressed or over-educated, Oscar Wilde. David, if I was to ask you how many rules there are when it comes to getting your head into selling and sales, what number would you pick? I would say 49. <laughs> and why? Because we know the answer to life, the universe, and everything is 42. So why are there seven extra rules needed for sales because david sandler did so much thinking about this and had so much experience going from being a very successful 30 something to essentially not quite penniless overnight but pretty close and having to you know rebuild his, his business career rebuild his skill set and in doing so single-handedly transformed how selling is done well so if he after all that experience says there's 49 rules it's a pretty odd number but it worked for him it's worked for probably hundreds of thousands of people since the late 1960s and it's still a pretty decent guide to help you you know sell your product or service more effectively and with less stress and and we're bringing this up because the the topic of uh, Sandler training has come up in our conversations internally recently with different people we've been interacting with, and so I thought it was a perfect time 
uh, to look at maybe two or three aspects of this realm of Sandler training, which is one of the purveyors of training out there in the world. And one of the things you said to me with me, David, that really grabbed you by the scruff of your neck within the realm of the Sandler approach to sales was the power of the future, yes. What the heck does that mean? I thought this was a great idea because so many salespeople I've interacted with are always you know, looking for the opportunity to make the sale, looking for the opportunity to make the sale, and in doing so, apply pressure on the prospect. And then the prospect feels even more pressure to lie or evade because they're being pushed. And I really like the approach David Sandler came up with, which is the idea of the future, yes. And it's that if you're the salesperson and you've had a first chat with a prospect and it's clear they've got a pain point, and you've got them to elaborate on what they need to achieve, what they want to achieve, what would improve the situation, and you think your product or service is a good fit, the Sandler approach is to say to the prospect, okay, it looks like it would be worth us having a further conversation, but I need to ask you a question. If I put all the work in to do a really detailed presentation for you next week or at a time we can both agree on, at the end of that conversation, if I can meet all your requirements, would you be in a position to say yes and spend the money to buy our product or service? And you know, Sandler was quite unique in setting up these future yeses from what I can work out. And it makes it clear where the salesperson is going. It gives the prospect a chance to say no or yes, but to know what they're saying no or yes to. So the salesperson moves forward to prepare the presentation knowing that, well, if I get this right, the person said they can say yes. Mm. And the prospect has reached the conclusion, I'm interested enough, and if this is good enough, I can say yes. And, well, I can always still say no, but at least we're on the same page and we've taken some of the adversarial nature of it away. We've taken away some of the misunderstandings and the salesperson doesn't have to apply as much pressure and the prospect doesn't have to be as evasive. So I, I really like this idea as a way of essentially, it's almost like getting a form of consent for the next step of talking about how much work should the salesperson put in and how prepared is the prospect to listen. And if the prospect says, no, actually, after a presentation, I would be in no state to say yes. Well, that's not worth it as a prospect. The salesperson can then ask the next question. Well, is this something where you would like me to get back to you in a month? Are any of these circumstances going to change? Or could I do anything to help change these circumstances? Or is it simply where you are at the moment? It's not worth me doing a presentation because you aren't in a position to purchase a product or service that would change your pain point. Hmm. So it suddenly changes the whole nature of the conversation and makes it you know, a lot less icky for salespeople to sell things. The other thing I like about it is that by asking the person, look, if I, if I get this right, would you be in a position to say yes? Knowing they could still say no, but you've increased the chance that A, they've got a nice easy way to get out now without being embarrassed about coming yep. up with an excuse after an elaborate presentation. But secondly, uh, Robert Cialdini makes this point really clear in a lot of his Psychology of Persuasion books about our internal needs for consistency. If we've heard ourselves say, yes, we could say yes, then when that time comes, it's actually a big job for us to say, well, actually, that sounds great, but I'm going to say no, because mm. we're not now being internally consistent with the image of us and the public pledge that we made to you in the outset. So some of that science of persuasion is mm. right at the heart of what uh, Sandler's talking about here. And the interesting thing is, you know, David Sandler got there 20 years before Cialdini was doing his research. <laughs> well, there you go. So it's amazing. You know, he worked out from experience and he was very interested in transactional analysis, which is one of the first big psychological theories that, you know, help people like Cialdini work out how influence works. So there's a wonderful tie up between good psychological research and a salesperson actually going, why am I applying pressure and feeling icky when instead I can have a conversation and be helpful? Like consultative selling is so much better a way to move forward because the salesperson doesn't have to twist them out of shape and the prospect doesn't have to deal with someone who's twisted out of shape. 
Mm, well, actually, it's on that transactional analysis. That was something else I wanted us to talk about today in this conversation is you broke it down really interestingly, almost like the holy trinity of the consumer or the potential buyer in the way Sandler argues about this, about what the emotional, the child, the parent and the adult. Do you want to just expand on that? Absolutely. So one of the things that Sandler took away from transactional analysis, which was a, a psychological approach that said that, you know, people are always both emotional and rational. And what transactional analysis came up with is there is an emotional child, there is a very responsible adult, and there is a parent who decides if it's a good idea. And in the sales case, what Sandler got this to is the child wants, the adult decides, and the parent gives permission that we can go ahead. And he worked out that the child who wants normally wants to fulfill a goal or get rid of pain. We all know that's very, very central to sales and marketing. So find out what the pain point is. Find out what the dream is. But then you've got to swap to the rational. You've got to help the adult understand here are all the good reasons why our product or service could help you get rid of that pain point or achieve that goal. But in the end, it won't be reason that gets the person finally over the line. It goes back to the parent going, well, it would make the child happy, and I think it's a responsible choice. So it really starts emotional, then moves rational. And the final bit is the emotional brain and the rational brain get themselves on the same page. So the child wants, the adult can see the benefit, but the emotional parent, who's both emotional and rational, then gives permission. And it's an interesting way to look at it and to realize that when you interact with people, you know, clients, providers, salespeople, everybody, really, that it's that to and fro between things being a bit more emotional, a bit more rational, a bit more emotional, a bit more rational, and that this is how people are. And that we should accept that interplay and not manipulate emotions and not expect people to always be rational. Because if you do one or the other, you're always missing that it's a combination of the two that informs behaviour. Interesting. It's like a grown-up approach to interacting with a potential customer. Yeah. Where, because the thing I've always got my hackles up was where you, you hear people talking in the sales world and they reduce humans down to quota that you yeah. have to get through the doors. And it, it's always struck me as being absolutely horrible, like yeah. really anathema to anything that I'd want to be part of. But this approach we'll be seeing, we don't want to tr trick people. We actually just want to be open in the whole process. It's like the pigeon pair of inbound marketing that we've talked about a number of times, which is leading out on our marketing by helping educate, helping people understand what could help them deal with the pain point they're experiencing. So no pressure. They can then choose to come to us. Fantastic. And then when those conversations start, when we shift from marketing into sales, we don't suddenly go all shyster on them. We continue with this higher approach to just being adults about it. Yep. And the amazing thing is Sandler was doing this in a, a period where he probably wasn't the only one who had worked out that traditional pressure sales don't work. But mm. I think he was probably the first to really systematize it and work out how to train people. And that was basically an accident. You know, a client he had sold a motivational material to, which is the job he was in while he was transitioning to being a sales training person, simply rang him back and said, You're so good at working out what people need and helping them, I want you to train my 100-person sales you know, workforce. And Sandler's like, <laughs> I know how to talk to individual people to sell the product I'm selling, but to actually sell how to sell? And you know, he, he kind of realized, hang on, what have I been learning to do for a couple of years? Yeah. Exactly this. Well, keep treating people like they are a clever and emotional and rational and engaged and they have pain points and they have goals and listen to where they're at, and then help them. And I'm like, you know, he was a very successful guy, and a lot of people write very nice things about him historically because 
he was quite selfless despite being very driven to be a wealthy guy. He's an interesting hmm. kind of role model for how to be in business and stay ethical and stay balanced and you know to not do harm along the way. Well, let's finish off this conversation with one of the rules, and I've selected one, David. I love rule number two. Don't spill your candy in the lobby, and we're going to hear it espoused by uh, Dave Matson, who now is heading up the Sandler Training uh, Company, you were saying. Is that right, David? Yeah. yeah. He took over when uh, David Sandler died in, I think, the late 90s. Okay. Let's have a listen to rule number two. Hi, it's Dave. Hey, don't spill your candy in the lobby. That's rule number two. I'll tell you what that's about. You know, when Sandler was growing up, he would wait for a movie and get all his candy and his popcorn. He would enjoy it throughout the movie. But sometimes he spilled it in the lobby because he was rushed. He didn't really pay attention. Well, that's what you do as a salesperson as well sometimes. When you spill your candy in the lobby, you're rushing. You just show up and throw up all over your prospect, your buyer. Let me tell you about our products. Let me tell you about this. Let me tell you how wonderful we are. The fact of the matter is, the only way people care about what you do and how wonderful you are is if you can connect your products and services with what is important to them, their problems, their pain. And that's what you have to uncover through questioning. Become a doctor, ask good questions, and then link your product knowledge to their problem and you will close sales. Well, first of all, I just love that uh, description, the analogy of spilling the candy in the lobby. Uh, it's, it's an evocative image. It's one that, yes, of course, you don't want to do that. You want to save that till you're sitting in the cinema and the movie's engaged, uh, engaging. But perhaps that's something we could all reflect on and put into practice this week is if we do get into a scenario where we're with someone who might be a customer, hold back. Don't talk about us. Ask questions about them which actually would apply well to life, not just in the dynamic of selling. Very much so. Again, Sandler's real point here was, you know the features and benefits of your product, but you don't yet know the pain, pole, pain point or goal of your prospect. So ask questions and find out as much as you can about their pain point and goal and how they want to get there and what things they're interested in. And then if your product or service fits, then you can start unpacking your candy. But once it's genuinely being helpful to them and they're convinced that you're different, you're listening and you're engaging in a thoughtful way and you're reflecting and responding to them rather than just, you know, spilling your candy all over them. Yes. David, can I ask you, would you be satisfied and, and comfortable and happy if we moved on now to the next segment? I absolutely would. Our four Ps. Number three, problems. I asked the question for the best reason possible. Simple curiosity. Oscar Wilde. I'm going to share a problem that a client's had in real life over the last weekend before we recorded this, and it all comes down to spelling. A uh, dear client uh, has decided to get a paid plan of Zoom for her work, and I got a call or a message in distress that she had registered but then wasn't able to pay. Nothing was happening, hitting dead end. So I offered that I could step in and help. She said, no, 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 I'm going to conquer this, so fair enough. And I got the message this morning, 48 hours of struggle and frustration and hair being pulled out. And it all came down to the fact that she was misspelling her email address. Just one letter was wrong at a crucial point in the process and was absolutely doing her hair in, or her head in uh, and her hair out. David, sometimes it's just those simple little things. It's the equivalent of IT people saying, hey, just turn the machine off and on again. Yeah, it's one of those things that I kind of feel ridiculous each time I fill in a form, checking the spelling of my name and the spelling of my email address, but I can't break the habit of doing it. 
Yes. So there you go. A really quick little problem. If you are ever in that sort of loop of hell, just slow down and really double check the spelling. And sometimes we're too close to it. The brain is filling in the gaps. Have someone look over our shoulder. Double check. It could give you 48 hours of your life back. Our four Ps. Number four, perspicacity. The one duty we owe to history is to rewrite it. Oscar Wilde. That was meant to be the sound of a Coke bottle opening. David, did it convince you? I found it relatively convincing. Good. Maybe I could be the new AI generative audio creator. Uh, Look, I'm mentioning this because in perspicacity in this episode, when we look at typically older campaigns, ads that have become part of the, the furniture at their time and question whether they would still work today, this time we've got one hot off the press. It's only about a month or so old. It's from Coca Cola. It's called The Masterpiece. And it caught my attention because this ad is a blending. It's a blending of real life actors and a generative AI, which is where, and and a whole lot of uh, special effects too, but generative AI is where you use text-based prompts and the system generates images out of whole cloth right before your eyes. And uh, in fact, you can see the ad on our show notes. You can just hit play and and have a look at that. But in essence, there's a, a young man in an art gallery, an art student who's sitting down with his sketch pad and suddenly... I think it starts with Andy Warhol's famous uh, Coke bottle painting. The Coke bottle becomes animated and starts being thrown around from painting to painting. I, I reckon the Mona Lisa's in there at some point. You know, it's it's going around the place. And so it's very well done. It's an amazing example. But here's the question, David. Is this going to be a persuasive ad to drink Coke, or more or less a showcase of where AI technology is at at the moment. And before you answer, it reminded me of the very early days of 3D movies, or in in my era, I remember in the early 80s, seeing these really bad spaghetti Western-style movies in which the bandit was sweeping in the the wooden uh, hideout We're watching him and he's sweeping and he stops, lifts the broom up and pokes it weirdly at the audience. It was because they could do that in 3D and, of course, we all go, oh, and it was completely out of place in the story. There is no reason he needed to do that. He was doing it because they could, not because they should. David? I think that parallel you've drawn there between instead of using the 3D effectively in the 80s in the movie and instead doing a a stunt, which made the stunt of 3D far more memorable than the movie. Like you can remember the broom being pointed at you. Can you remember anything? Who was the hero? Who was the bad guy? Who got tied to the railway track? I I remember one other thing, opening a can of dried beans, a big barrel of dried beans, and dropping them down. Of course, we were underneath and they were falling at us again. Yeah. No one's Once ever. Again, <laughs> whether it had any reason in the plot whatsoever, all you remember is the two things that were deliberate stunts. Correct. And I, I'm, my feeling is that, you know, with the, the moment, the excitement and the fear about AI, the ad is going to be memorable for those who are excited about AI going, wow, look at what generative AI can do. And for those who are scared of AI, it's, wow, look at what AI can do. And now AI that I'm frightened of has been attached to Coke. And I'm kind of afraid of Coke too, because it's got enough sugar in it to do bad things to me. I've now heard that message for 20 years. So I think Coke may have just done an own goal where the last thing that will benefit from the ad is Coca-Cola. Yeah, and the first one is all the people selling the latest tools in AI and visual yeah. effects, etc. Look, it's, it's true. There is one thing that's interesting is that typically Coke ads have ridden trends, but they tended to be outdoor trends. I remember you know, a lot of surfing and the ads in the, in the 70s and you had hopping in those big blow-up uh, plastic balls and you know, walking like 
mice inside uh, those yeah. things, across the the river, uh, sand surfing, uh, going down whatever you call that on on big sand dunes. Yeah, it was always you're very young, you're very fit, you're doing a very outdoory activity, and you can absorb this much sugar because you've just burnt that many calories. Yes, but here so it was the ultimate thing of trying to sell a fantasy. Whereas here, it, again, how many people fantasize sitting still? and drawing in an art gallery. Now, they've got the sitting still thing right. Most people who drink large amounts of Coke spend a lot of time sitting still. <laughs> well, that's the odd thing. This is a protagonist in a Coke ad who is actually sitting still and then just going to drink Coke as mm. well. So that's a, that's a weird aspect. I mean, mm. but it is really well done. And mm. maybe own goal is a little harsh, but it's in the mix, David. I'm I'm with you because it, I don't think it's going to lead to any extra sales of Coke, but it is being talked about. Maybe subliminally, it's mm. keeping Coke connected to the edge. And, yeah, depending on where you sit on that edge, which we're going to talk about more in the next episode, the world of AI, et cetera, yeah, maybe it is a fizzer from their perspective. It will fizz either way. Oh, one last thing before we finish this. In applying this to future ads, this is always going to be the case when there's a new trend. The early adopters want to try and use the technology. But do you send, I, I sense that there's a like, a, like when you crack open a, a Coke bottle and, there's, it, and the bubbles rise and then it sort of settles down again. Maybe this is that. And this is not a sustainable way of doing advertising, but it's in the mix if you've got the budget and you want to have that positioning as a leader. I think Coke will do the clever ad next and it will be that someone is out on the surfboard or going down the sand dune on their whatever kind of board you use on a sand dune um, and they'll go, damn, I wish I had a Coke. And the bottle will literally you know, fly out of the water or whatever, land on the front of the board and go catch me if you can. Okay. You know, it, it'll be, it will get used cleverly, just not yet. At the moment, there's the awe of the technology. And it always takes a little bit of time to get past the awe of technology. Remember that the purpose of the ad is to make the product appealing, not the technology behind it. Yeah, and we're just on that cusp where we're being distracted by the technology. Exactly. Our eyes off the ball. Oh, well, Coke ads AI. Thank you for listening to Talking About Marketing. If you enjoyed it, please leave a rating or a review in your favourite podcast app. And if you found it helpful, please share it with others. Steve and David always welcome your comments and questions, so send them to podcast at talkedaboutmarketing.com. And finally, the last word to Oscar Wilde. There's only one thing worse than being talked about, and that's not being talked about.